असतो मा सद्गमय तमसो मा ज्योतिर्गमय मृत्युर्मा अमृत गमय ओ शातिशाशाति ओम लीड अस फ्रॉम द अनरियल टू द रियल लीड अस फ्रॉम डार्कनेस अन टू लाइट लीड अस फ्रॉम डेथ to immortality om peace 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 namaskar and good morning everybody i see a few familiar masks <laughs> uh today is also mothers day so happy mothers day to everybody who's here and those who are watching online it is also rabindranath tagore's birthday uh but i heard naturally in india in the midst of so much sickness and suffering and death nobody is in much of a uh, mood to celebrate anything our subject too is relevant it has to do with suffering and how to overcome suffering in a very deep permanent way the मंत्र ऑफ द ब्रदारण्यक उपनिषद आत्मा चेदीयात अयमस्मी पुष किमीछन कस्य काय शरीर अनुसंज्वरे इफ वी वे टू रियलाइज आर सेल्स एज आई एम दिस इन्फिनेट एक्जिस्टेंस कॉन्शियसनेस प्लेस in that case if with that realization who would um, for whose sake desiring what would one go on suffering with along with the body so a view of human suffering the nature of suffering and uh, the true nature of our self what we truly are that we are not the not the suffering body not even the suffering mind and that we can realize something beyond suffering and by realizing that we go beyond suffering so this is a very wonderful way of summarizing the whole of advaita vedanta and we are lucky that vidyaranya the great uh, medieval master of advaita vedanta has dedicated the largest chapter uh, of his book panchadashi the seventh chapter to an analysis of this mantra the vedanta upanishad mantra in that uh, chapter with nearly 300 verses he takes up the story of the 10th man which is our subject today the story of the 10th man a very well known parable and analyzes it in detail in fact that's the chapter where we find a very extensive discussion of that story and how it applies to spiritual life so that's what we'll do today we'll rely upon uh, vidyaranya and undertake an analysis of the story i have told it on other occasions but it bears retelling the story is pretty simple and rather cute it talks about 10 friends who went on a journey and uh, these 10 friends they on the journey they cross a river and having crossed the river they um they suddenly think did we all cross or did anybody drown in the river let's count we are supposed to be 10 so let's count and somebody counts 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 that can't be right again counts 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 oh my god the 10th person is missing must have drowned in the river and the others say let me count let me count you, you this can't be right and he, each of them they count and they find there are only 9 people obviously they're not counting themselves so they find there are only 9 people and they they jump to the conclusion that the 10th friend the 10th man is dead has drowned and they weep and wail until um a wise man passes by you don't have to be too wise to you know <laughs> see through this problem so this passes by and uh, he says why are you crying my friends they say our friend the 10th person is dead how do you know well there were 10 of us when we started and now there are only 9 we crossed the river obviously the our friend the 10th man has drowned 
Um, how do you know that there are nine and not ten? Uh, because we counted. Well, the, um, this man said, don't cry, my friends. The tenth man is there. The tenth man is alive and well and is, is present right here. Where? I'll show him to you. Count. And he said, we have already counted. Well, humor me, count again. So one of them counted one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, I told you. And this man comes and takes the hand of the counter and turns it towards himself and says, Thou art the tenth. You are the tenth. Dashamastuamasi in Sanskrit. You are the tenth. Ten. And this man gets it. He says, Oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then ten. Ah, the tenth man is there. The tenth man has been found and he's so delighted. And the others say, let me try, let me try. And they try and each one, they find the tenth man and so they are very happy. And we are happy for them. Now, how does that apply to spiritual life? So Vidyarnya does a wonderful thing here. Notice, before we get into it, notice the, the wonderful pedagogy of this teaching. Uh, here, the tenth man is not, you're not only told that the tenth man is there, but it's directly pointed out and revealed by this method of teaching. The person, the student who is learning uh, is not only told that there is the tenth man, but also comes to see and realize immediately, directly, without any doubt, oh, here it is, I am the tenth person. So this is the uniqueness of Vedantic pedagogy, the methodology of teaching. See, one kind of teaching is uh, bhakti, where you are told that, um, the scriptures say God exists and if you believe in, in God and surrender to God and love God, your problems will be solved. And that's fine. But that depends upon faith and belief and surrendering and waiting. Then there is the yogic method, the method of mystical experience, where you're told that you don't have to believe in such things, but uh, there are this set of uh, psychophysical exercises you have to undergo. You sit in this way, breathe in this way, concentrate and focus in this way, and you will get certain mystical experiences, samadhis, various kinds of mystical experiences, visions, which will prove to you the truth of, of the uh, spiritual path. Here also you are given a set of instructions, which you have to do. If you don't do it, it, it won't lead to anything at all. Um, but contrast this with the Vedantic methodology of teaching, the Vedantic pedagogy, where you're not only told that the tenth person is there, but you're shown. There's nothing more left to be done after that. You, by the very method of teaching, you come to see. And this coming to see, uh, it's seeing with a capital S, coming to see. This seeing is darshan, realization. Swami Bhuteshananda Ji used to say, Brahmo darshan hai na, brahmo gyan hai. You don't have a um, darshana or a vision of Brahman. You have the knowledge of Brahman. So this is this is the actually the only Brahma darshana that is possible. The vision or the realization of Brahman is the knowledge of Brahman, and this knowledge of Brahman is given directly by this method of teaching. The tenth man. The story is so interesting. It shows the teaching is not just transmission of information. It's actually giving the realization that I am the tenth. And that actually applies to Vedanta itself. So we'll see how. Vidyaranya says that there are seven stages in this story. If you look carefully, you can find seven stages. And then he'll apply it to our spiritual journey. What are the seven stages? The first is ignorance, agyanam. So when the um, question arises, is the did we all cross? This idea of the tenth man is completely hidden in ignorance for them. What, who or what or where is the tenth man? And then the next stage, so this agyanam ignorance is the first stage. The second st stage is where what is called avaranam. The ignorance it results in a covering of the truth. So they say that um, the tenth man is not there. I do not see the tenth man. My friend, I can't see my friend. I can only see nine. The tenth person I cannot see. So this is the second stage. Avaranam. Na asti na bhati. I do not see and therefore it does not exist. And then the third stage comes where they sit and weep and wail which is called vikshepa. The stage of suffering. Based on, born out of 
the uh, the covering and the ignorance the first two stages ignorance and covering that results in suffering vikshepa the vikshepa literally means projection what do i project my friend has drowned look how far it has come river friend has drowned all those things this is nowhere grounded in the truth but we have projected it already my friend has drowned oh what a terrible tragedy and then there comes the fourth stage which is called paroksha jnana indirect knowledge what you might call theoretical knowledge or indirect knowledge what is that when the wise person says stop crying the tenth man is there your friend is there that's the tenth that is the um, stage of indirect knowledge they still don't know they still haven't realized where is the tenth person uh, but they sort of believe in this person that who is telling them that their friend is alive but they are hope clutching clutching on to it with hope that maybe yes he's right he seems to be a competent person maybe the tenth person is still there so that's an indirect kind of knowledge and then comes the direct realization and that is the uh, fifth stage the fifth stage is the direct realization oh i am the tenth the man points out you are the tenth and this man realizes 10 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 i am the tenth so that is the uh, stage of aparoksha jnana direct realization and then there is the sixth stage which is dukkha nivritti the sorrow goes away the sorrow and the suffering oh our friend has died our friend has drowned that suffering goes away that weeping and wailing goes away dukkha nivritti and the seventh stage is the point of the whole thing tripti that is bliss or happiness and they are very happy now we have all our 10 friends together uh, it's complete now this is the analysis of the story now vidyaranya applies it to our spiritual journey the spiritual journey of the jiva the individual sentient being and say what is an individual sentient being sounds rather formidable that's you that's us the individual being the spiritual seeker our journey and he says exactly those seven stages if you apply it you'll see those seven stages in our life the first is stage of ignorance the individual being the jiva is completely ignorant of its of our real we are ignorant of our real nature as satchidananda as existence consciousness bliss we are fully identified with this body and mind and that's what we think we are um, it's remember the the classic example of the face in the mirror this is my real face and i look into the mirror and i see a reflected face there now suppose i have forgotten somehow for some weird reason i have forgotten that this is my face and i think i am that one in the mirror and then i identify myself with that one and its fortunes and misfortunes are my fortunes and misfortunes a dirty mirror becomes a dirty face a convex or concave or cracked mirror um, you know it uh, the reflection is distorted and i say that i am that one look how it is suffering something like that has happened in the first stage agyana ignorance beginningless ignorance and from lifetime to lifetime we are identified with this body and mind and this is the state of the jiva the individual being but this is not all it goes to the next level that that is avaranam where this ignorance is expressed uh, in the covering up of the real nature the covering up is 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 manifested as when we say na bhati na asti that i i the pure consciousness what you talk what, what you know existence consciousness bliss satchidananda such a thing is not there and it na bhati even if it is there it doesn't it doesn't i i'm not i'm not experiencing it just like the 10th person who said the 10th person is not there not only that he is saying i'm not experiencing the 10th person both are not true 10th person is there he is himself the 10th person and he is himself experiencing himself all the time and yet he claims 10th person is not there i do not ex- experience this 10th person exactly like that advaita vedanta claims that we feel the jiva feels at this second stage that that satchidananda atman uh, pure consciousness infinite being such a thing is not there and i don't experience it na asti na bhati does not exist and not experienced at all 
underlying this implicit is the Advaitic claim that it not only exists, it exists. It is also being experienced all the time. <laughs> this is the interesting thing. Na asti na bhati. And because of that, what do I think myself to be? This body and this mind, identified with this mind and body, I am identified with all the actions and experiences of this body-mind. In technical terms, karta bhokta. I am the doer of actions, good and bad. And I am the experiencer <coughs> of the results of my karma, good and bad. So I enjoy, I suffer, I desire, I am frustrated. I am born with the birth of the body, I age with the aging of the body, I suffer disease with the disease of the body and I die and I become old age and then, then after old age there is death, I die with the death of the body. I don't even use that language. I become old, I become diseased, I die. This is karta and bhokta. I am the doer of deeds and I am the experiencer of the results of karma. This is, we are caught in the, the cycle of cause and effect, law of karma. And this goes not only one lifetime, this is extended over many, many lifetimes. <coughs> this is the third stage. This is called vikshepa, suffering, samsara. So we have got three stages here. One is ignorance of our real nature. And then the expressed ignorance, that is the hiding, the covering of our, of our real nature, where we say, such a thing does not exist, Atman does not exist. And... I do not experience it. And then the third stage of vikshepa, that I am a samsari. This is the third stage in the spiritual journey of the jiva. I am a samsari. What can I do? I, I suffer. Um, and I, if you believe in multiple lives, I am going through this life after life. Then, by chance, you may wander into the Vedanta society and stumble upon a class of <laughs> Vedanta and or let us be liberal why just Vedantas you come to spiritual life maybe after many lifetimes of uh, suffering after many lifetimes of, of you know then the inquiry arises what is this why is this going on what is the point of all this uh, struggle and uh, misery and suffering an inquiry arises the meaning of it all and then we come to spiritual life and then you are told that um, you were mistaken all along. Uh, we are mis we're deeply mistaken about ourselves. As Swami Vivekananda used to say, if only you know yourselves as you truly are. That we are not this body, not this mind. We are existence, consciousness, bliss. Chidananda, uh, Rupa, Shivoham, as Shankaracharya sings. So we are told this. And... Um, we come to, first of all, we believe, well, maybe what the Swami is saying, and there's so many of these books, and they're really ancient books, maybe if, since they're so old, they must be right somehow. Yeah. We have got some kind of faith, some kind of belief, some kind of... Uh, we even use our logic and our reasoning that, yes, it's possible. Uh, all these arguments which are being given in Vedanta, uh, they seem to indicate the possibility that I'm actually not this body, or at least not just this body, something deeper, something uh, more profound is there about my own real nature. And the rishis of the Upanishads have said it. Uh, I did not know this. Recently I discovered, uh, I heard it in one of the talks of Swami Pitambaranji, where he talks about the um, great Marathi saint, uh, Sant Gyaneshwar. It seems he said that, what are the Upanishads? The rishis, they were, they gorged themselves on self-knowledge, on atma jnana. They were full of knowledge of the self, full of knowledge of Brahman. And like having eaten a very hearty meal, you burp. So they burped. And the burp is the Upanishads. So the Upanishads are the, the burp of, this, of these rishis who are full of, of self-knowledge, of knowledge of, of the Absolute. So since... Uh, we have a tendency to trust the philosophical burps of uh, the rishis. So we get this, this um, uh, indirect knowledge. This is called paroksha jnana. What is the nature of the paroksha jnana? Brahma asti. 
there is such a re- such a reality called brahman which is infinite existence infinite consciousness infinite bliss such a thing is there and that that uh, like the 10th man the 10th man is there the wise person says the 10th man is there they still don't know where is the 10th man but they begin to understand or at least they begin to have some kind of conviction some kind of peace of mind that <coughs> maybe it's possible that the 10th man is there similarly we get a kind of faith that it is possible perhaps that such a reality is there uh, existence consciousness bliss which is immortal with not subject to death not subject to disease not subject to the ups and downs of the mind the uh, the the elation and the depression of the mind such a reality might be there but we don't know where it is and uh, even when we are told you are that we don't understand how am i that we still say it, it's not clear it's not appearing to me i don't experience it and then we come to the the fifth stage which is aparoksha gyana exactly like that uh, follow the uh, un- the story of the 10th man it's exactly like that we come to the stage of aparoksha gyana aparoksha gyana means the direct realization or direct knowledge just as that man pointed out you are the 10th count 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 9 and you are the 10th and he realizes that i am the 10th exactly like that vedanta gives us a series of methodologies which culminates if it works if it is used properly if it works then it will culminate in the sudden direct it's like a veil falling from your eyes you suddenly it's like an awakening you awaken into this uh, tremendous realization that not only is it there existence consciousness bliss but i am it not only is the 10th man there but i am the 10th how does it work so the teacher tells you that start with since you are the 10th and you don't realize it start with what you think uh, is the 10th or the atman um, what do you think is the self and uh, just like that man counted 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 we are guided into it by the, by vedanta count what do you think you are body all right first one and this body <coughs> and then we are shown why we cannot be the body um with certain reasons we will look at this at the end of this talk and actually how to apply the 10th man story to our personal spiritual life that we cannot be the body for certain reasons and we begin to see that we cannot be the body we are the experiencer of the body something within the body which is experiencing the body an embodied awareness and then are you the the life processes the prana uh, which uh, you know the breathing and the hunger and thirst and assimilation of food all the biological processes in this body which keep the body alive prana are you that and we are led to understand that we cannot be the prana also so it's exactly like counting 1 2 3 4 5 6 here the counting is from the outermost body then inner we experience the prana are you this prana and we see that no we are the experiencer of the prana we are not the prana itself it's a process it's like an object um an objective process subtler and more inverse to the prana the mind are you the mind and when we the same arguments apply even the mind is something that we experience thoughts feelings memories desires then you see you're not the mind then count deeper so you have gotten already three and body no that's one then the prana no i'm not the prana that's two then the mind no i cannot be the mind that's three and then you go deeper intellect those who know you know that i'm going through the panchakosha method but there are different methods one is the panchakosha method <coughs> the intellect itself um are you the intellect even the intellect which we which we are using right now to experience to understand all of this am i that that also i am an observer that also i am experiencing the workings of that intellect i am not that intellect also so i'm counting that's number 
beyond the intellect beyond the mind and the intellect if you probe if you try to experience actually phenomenologically if you try to experience you will see you hit a blankness <coughs> you hit a blankness um and that blankness is indicative of the causal body the ananda maya kosha um and that also is an is an object of experience i am not that either so and then i stop that's it whatever i could experience these are the ones i can you know when when you ask me what are you i look at my own experience about myself and i see the body one i see the prana two i see the mind three i see the intellect four i see the uh, ananda maya the causal body five that's it and i i'm convinced i'm none of these so i am none of these and then so do i not exist the teacher will say that you exist and yet you are none of the five possible candidates then what are you and there it's like that turning the hand of the counter thou art the tenth here you are intuitively supposed to grasp that you are the witness consciousness of those five sheets that to which the body and the prana and the mind and the intellect and the causal body they are appearing to which they are they are you know you you can see the changes in the in those five sheets that witness consciousness i am now it's not a matter of just saying it it must be caught intuitively just as the tenth man caught it intuitively that oh i am the tenth 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 9 and then 10 similarly we are supposed to catch that physical vital mental intellectual causal none of those i am they are there they are functioning but none of them i am not them then i am the one which is experiencing them not to say it is an answer to to in a first person sense to directly <coughs> to directly experience it to directly catch it intuitively that i am this one so that would be the stage of direct realization uh, which is aparoksha gyana we suddenly realize i am this you know that brihadaranya upanishad mantra atmanam ched vijaniyat ayam asmi ti purushah when if we were somehow to realize i am this atman this existence consciousness bliss and then you see what is this you have discovered the one you have discovered is free is not the body therefore is free of the um, old age and disease and the suffering of the body it is not the prana prana it is free of the hunger and thirst and the um, the sickness which is in the prana both health and sickness they are because of the prana it is not the mind if it is not the mind then it must be free of the elation and the depression and the frustration and the likes and dislikes which are the prejudices which are embodied in the mind which are in and which are embedded in the mind it is not the intellect being the experience of the intellect it is not the intellect and therefore the ignorance and the confusion in the intellect it must be free of that and it's not even the causal body the causal body has the seeds of the entire personality so it's free of even the cause which gives rise to the personality it is entirely i the witness of all of these five sheets i am free of the person the person sarva priyananda does not attain freedom but i attain freedom from the person atmanam ched vijaniyat ayam asmi ti purushah if i were to realize myself as this infinite being why am i keep, why do i keep saying infinite being what is finite the body is finite the body has a beginning the body is subject to change and decay and old age and the body is subject to death the mind is finite but where is the limit for that witness which which in which the body and mind appear function and disappear that witness is unlimited it has no beginning in time it has no end in time time appears to it 
It is not in time. Time is in it. Space appears to it. It is not in space. It, the body is located in space. Is consciousness located in space? Space and time are, are experienced by that, that consciousness. So, this, when I realize that I am this consciousness, I realize that this, this is unlimited and it's free of suffering. So, the sixth stage comes. Dukkha Nivritti. The sixth stage, when the tenth man who realized that I am the tenth and then they were free of suffering that my, my friend, the tenth man has drowned, that suffering goes away. No, the tenth man is not drowned. The tenth man is alive and well. Similarly, we become free of suffering of samsara. No, I am not the body. No, I am not the mind. Natvam deho nated. Natvam deho natvam dehi. Karta bhokta natvam bhavan. Ashtavakra says, you are not only the body, you are not even the one who is embodied in the body. You are not the body and the body does not belong to you. You are not the owner of the body either. You are totally free of the body. The body appears to you and it undergoes its changes. But you are not, just like the mirror appears to you and you are reflected in the mirror. And whatever happens to the mirror affects the reflection also. But at no point is my real face affected by the mirror or the reflection. Mirror may crack and the reflection may be distorted. But that does not affect my real face at all. It is no connection between them. Similarly, I the witness consciousness, I the sakshi, the pure consciousness. I realize that I am not affected by the changes of the body. By the ups and downs of the body. By the ups and downs of the mind. Raga dvesho mano dharma namanaste kadachana. Ashtavakra sings. Raga dvesha. Dispositions, likes and dislikes. They are, they are attributes of the mind. The mind itself is not yours. Namanaste kadachana. You are not the mind and the mind is not yours. Completely dissociate yourself from the mind. Dissociate is you don't have to do anything. Recognize that I am not it. You are immediately set free from it. Or you realize that you always were free from it. Namanaste kadachana. So we are free of suffering. This is called Dukkha Nivritti. Sixth stage. And then, sixth stage of what? Our spiritual journey. And then when we recognize the nature of the spirit, the nature of the Atman, that it is infinite existence and infinite consciousness, this very infinity of the Atman is bliss. The infinity of the Atman is bliss. Chandogya Upanishad says, Yo vai bhuma tat sukham, nalpe sukham asti. That which is the infinite, that alone is happiness. There is no happiness in the limited. In that which will... Age and die, what happiness is there? In that pleasure which has a beginning and an end very soon, what happiness is there ultimately? That which is unlimited is happiness. So, this self which I have, I have now recognized, this infinite existence consciousness, this itself is bliss. Will there be bliss in the mind of the enlightened person? Remember, even after this realization, the world will continue to appear, the body will continue to appear, the mind will continue to appear, even the personality will continue to be appear. They are now relegated to the realm which we call Vavaharika, transactional, lower, false, mithya. But they continue to appear like a magic show, like a movie. They will not affect us, but the body-mind will be filled and suffused with Peace and bliss and completion. The enlightened person attains true happiness. He or she, the, there's no gender in the, uh, in the self. So that is infinite in itself. And the reflection is on the mind of the enlightened person, that, um, whom we call the enlightened person. That mind will be suffused by happiness, by peace, by completion. This is the goal of human life. A devotee wrote to me, a few days ago, that um, many years ago, uh, she was watching, there was a monk and she was watching scenes of a city, a busy city from a window and there was a monk standing there nearby and that monk asked her, where are all these people going? 
And they got a busy scene in the city. Where are all these people going? And she said, they're all going about their business. You know, somebody's going to office, somebody's going to school, somebody's going for a walk. And the monk said, no, they're all going in search of happiness. All of them, whatever you are, wherever you are, you're going in search of that bliss, that happiness. Swami Vivekananda, in very stirring language, it is for that, that love, that bliss, that the murderer murders, that the thief steals, that the mother loves, and today's Mother's Day. It is for the sake of that happiness only, that the mother loves the child. That a um, uh, person madly pursues money, and uh, the intellectual pursues knowledge, and the artist pursues creativity. It is for the sake of that bliss alone. That somebody becomes, uh, you know, um, a great conqueror and uh, uh, wreaks havoc upon nation after nation. It's a pursuit of this. Power is a pursuit of that same happiness. Whatever the pursuits of human life, whatever you see around you right now, it is all a rushing in pursuit of that same happiness. And is it, this is the seventh stage of spiritual life. Uh, tripti. That bliss is attained. Attained means it was always there. We realize it. And then our life, such as it remains for the rest of the life, the enlightened life, which is called Jivan Mukti, is full of the manifestation of this bliss. So seven stages. You see how the seven stages in the story of the tenth man are beautifully uh, synchronized with the seven stages of spiritual seeking. Avarana, ignorance of our real nature. Uh, no, first is ignorance, agyanam, ignorance of our real nature. I do not know that I am Brahman. Second, avarana, uh, I feel that such a thing does not exist, it's hidden. It does not exist. It is not experienced. Third, I suffer in samsara. Lifetime after lifetime. Fourth, the possibility of such a thing is revealed to me. When I come to Vedanta and I realize that such a reality beyond suffering exists. But I don't know where it is, what it is. And then the fifth stage, which is aparoksha jnana. The fourth stage is paroksha jnana, indirect knowledge. Fifth stage, aparoksha jnana, direct realization. I am Brahman, aham brahmasmi. I realize it. Just like the tenth man realizes, oh, I am the tenth. And the result of that, phalam, the result is the next two. Um, dukkha nivritti, all suffering. Body will still age. Body may still get covid Body will still die. The, but you will be free of suffering. And the interesting thing is, the mind do, it will not continue as before. The mind will be affected by that realization. The mind of the enlightened person. Though the enlightened person says, I am not the mind. It's not that the mind will continue to be miserable like before. No, the mind will be full of peace and bliss. That attainment of bliss, that I am bliss, my very nature is bliss, and then the, that is reflected in the mind of the enlightened person, that is called tripti, the seventh stage. So these are the, are the seven stages. And Vidyaranya neatly classifies them into two broad groups. One group he calls bondage, bandha, and the other group he calls moksha, liberation. And it's interesting that the first three are obviously bandha, bondage, and that is uh, the stage of ignorance, the stage of concealment or covering, and the stage of samsara or suffering. Uh, agyanam, avaranam, and vikshepa. This is bondage. And most people, most, most people are in this. This first stage especially. There are millions of people today who are um, going about their lives not particularly interested, I'm not even saying Vedanta, but not even particularly interested in spiritual life. The question of what happens after death, is there anything at all after death? The question of whether God exists, the question of whether this, that I am this, uh, um, you know, transcendent spirit, existence, consciousness, bliss. These questions do not even arise for such people. They go on with life. They may even have some kind of religion, which is a kind of 
religion which sort of helps like a decoration in your house it's a part of your life you go to temple church you're part of some religious society and then give some contribution there that's a, what a good person in the world does might be like that that is ignorance and then comes the next level which is uh, actually feeling that such a thing does not exist i do not experience it and so on so this is bondage when we come to spiritual life when the enquiry starts and it starts for all of us here it has started and then we come to spiritual life specifically in vedanta we are told that our real nature is infinite beyond suffering this is the stage of indirect knowledge aparoksha uh, parok, uh, gyana we have heard about it we even believe it we even understand it to some extent but that's it it's not directly vividly real to us right now and then finally uh, when it clicks when it falls in place i am brahman so that's the uh, uh, fifth stage aparoksha gyana and the result of that will be phalam the result will be shoka nivritti and uh, tripti tripti and vidyarni uses different term he says shoka moksha freedom from suffering transcendence of suffering and the story is so beautiful the tenth man story number of subtle questions about all of this you can use it to answer those questions so four questions i'll quickly go through four possible objections which have not possible they have actually been raised the objections are very interesting if you look at the objections to the advaitic theory of the self uh, advaitic teaching about the self you understand it better the teaching itself you understand better if you take take these objections seriously what are these objections these objections are raised by opponents opponent is called purva paksha so the purva paksha raises the objections first of all you the non dualist you are saying that um, the self is always present isn't it um it is always vivid you are consciousness you are brahman you are always present and evident you are shining forth all the time that's your teaching yes we agree yes that's our teaching in that case how can ignorance ever be there what is ignorance something that i am not experiencing now something that i am not seeing now hearing now uh, smelling or tasting now something that i have not read about i am ignorant of that that is not present to me now that's why i'm ignorant about it but this self the atman you are talking about this pure consciousness you are talking about you are claiming again and again it's present all the time if it's pres- and not only present it is self revealed all the time it is shining forth you you happily sing about it tameva bhanta manubhati sarvam tasya bhasa sarvam idam vibhati that shining everything else shines by its light everything is revealed such a thing how can you be ignorant about it the very first problem you are saying ignorance how is ignorance possible ignorance is possible about some remote object which you don't know you come to know about it, you read about it or you go and see it fine but that which is always present effortlessly present and revealing itself you don't even have to do anything how can you be ignorant about it do you see the force of the objection first objection you say that the spiritual life first stage is ignorance and i say it is not possible to be ignorant about such a thing it's like looking at the sun and saying that i don't see the sun i'm ignorant of the sun how second knowledge is not possible what is knowledge that which removes ignorance if ignorance is not possible knowledge is also not possible that which is all the time available as i am what new knowledge will you get about it the knowledge about the self is not possible the self which you are talking about non dualist this existence consciousness bliss always there always shining ignorance is not possible therefore knowledge is also not possible See, they are cutting at the very root of Advaita Vedanta. The fundamental teachings are being attacked. Not only that, this you talked about direct knowledge and indirect knowledge. Paroksha jnana, paroksha jnana. Uh, indirect knowledge, direct knowledge. That also is not possible. Indirect knowledge. When is indirect knowledge possible? For something that is removed from you. Uh, I am here. 
I am not in Times Square. Now what is going on in Times Square is remote from me and I can only get an indirect knowledge about it. Somebody may report, there was a shooting in Times Square yesterday. There was actually. So there was a shooting. But I, I have no direct knowledge of it. Why do I not have direct knowledge of it? Because it is remote. But if something is directly present to you, you are all directly present to me right now. I mean literally, I mean without any, any kind of philosophical wrangling about it, I can actually see you. If you are literally present in front of me, do I need indirect knowledge about it? I can see Bill. I can see Bill. Now do I need a report? Bill is present. Do I need to see uh, somebody saying that Bill is present? Do I need an indirect reporting about it? No, I don't. That's silly. Because if what something is directly available to you, why do you need uh, indirect knowledge about it? And then you are saying there is indirect knowledge about the Atman. How is that possible? According to you, the Atman is always present. Even more than things which you can see, hear, smell, taste, touch, more than that. You are the self. You are always present. You don't even need eyes. Does, does a blind person not feel that he or she exists? Of course, it exists. So you don't need indirect knowledge about it. Why do you need to read about it? And direct knowledge is also not possible. Why? <laughs> Why direct knowledge is not possible? What is direct knowledge? Direct knowledge in, in um, Vedanta there is something called Pratyaksha. Paroksha, Pratyaksha, Paroksha. What is Paroksha? Indirect knowledge. Something is going on in Times Square, I don't know about it. So if you tell, give me knowledge about it, if you tell me about it, that becomes indirect knowledge for me, Paroksha. Paroksha literally means beyond the range of sense organs. So there, is, there are a lot of things beyond the range of sense organs. What's happening in other countries, what's happening at the microscopic level, uh, what's happening uh, or ab about the existence of God or heaven, all of these are classified as paroksha in Vedanta. And in contrast to this, there is a kind of knowledge classified as pratyaksha. Pratyaksha means that is directly present to your senses, something that you can directly see. You don't need to hear about it. You, so nobody has to give you theoretical knowledge about it. Something that you can directly see, there's something you can hear, something you can smell, taste, touch, that is called pratyaksha. And then even more direct than pratyaksha, mental states, the states of our mind. I have a pain. I have a desire, I feel happy, I feel miserable. How do we know these things? We know it. How do we know them? We know them directly in our own minds. Even more directly. Do you see? Pratyaksha means using sense organs. But our mental states, you don't even have to use sense organs. They are directly revealed to us in our own awareness. Pain, pleasure, happy, sad, understand, remember, forget. I can't remember. All these experiences we are having, all are in our mind. These are actually called aparoksha. Not indirect. Not even sensory. In the mind. Your atma, this about which you are talking about non-dualist, you will have direct knowledge of that. It's impossible. What can you have direct knowledge of? It has to be an object. The things in the world or in heaven, they are objects in which you have indirect knowledge. The things which you see, hear, smell, taste, touch, which you have perceptual knowledge, pratyaksha, they are objects. And which you have mental states, pain, pleasure, they are mental objects. That's why you are able to have knowledge of them. But the self, according to you, you non-dualist, you have sabotaged yourself because you have again and again said the self is not an object. How can you have direct knowledge of that? You cannot have indirect knowledge of it. You cannot have direct knowledge of it. There is no paroksha, pratyaksha, aparoksha possible of such a knowledge, of such a uh, self. Four questions. By now you must have forgotten. What was the first one? <laughs> the first one is, ignorance is not possible of, uh, of the self. 
Second one is knowledge is not possible of the self and more subtle. Third one is this so-called distinction between direct knowledge, indirect knowledge. Neither indirect knowledge is possible, nor direct knowledge is possible. Now you see, simply by looking at the story of the tenth man, we can answer all four questions easily. The tenth man was always present, was he not? And yet he was ignorant about his being the tenth man. Similarly, you the Atman, the infinite existence consciousness bliss, you are present all the time and you are, you are ignorant about that uh, reality about yourself. That you are this infinite being, you are ignorant about it. It is possible. Something to be always present and yet to be, ign be ignorant about it. And therefore knowledge is also possible. Was it not possible when that man came and said, Thou art the tenth, he actually gained the knowledge? It was always present, but the knowledge came and it removed that ignorance about himself, that I am the tenth. That ignorance was, uh, that knowledge removed the ignorance that the tenth man is dead, is gone. That ignorance was gone. That ignorance was removed by knowledge. Knowledge was possible in the case of the tenth man. Similarly, in the case of the Atman, though it's always present and shining, knowledge is possible. When we actually make the breakthrough and realize, I am this, I am Masmiti Purushaha. When we have that experience, I am this infinite being. It's clear, it's a breakthrough. Definitely it's a case of knowledge. A very strange, a very peculiar, interesting kind of knowledge. But it's knowledge. And the difference between indirect knowledge and direct knowledge, that also we see in the case of the tenth man. Did that wise man not say, don't cry, the tenth man is there. Though he was that person who was counting was himself the tenth man, what did he feel? Oh, there is some tenth man. Thank God, this man is telling me. Did he not get an indirect knowledge? So indirect knowledge, paroksha jnana is possible. After studying Vedanta, uh, the philosophical burps of the rishis, we get an indirect knowledge. That such a thing is possible. I believe it. I am certain such things um, that that infinite existence consciousness bliss. I am that in, I don't know how, but I am that infinite existence consciousness bliss. I even sing with great enthusiasm. Chidananda Rupa Shivoham. I feel very nice also. Indirect knowledge. It is possible. Why not? And finally, direct knowledge is also possible. Uh, did that tenth man not get the direct knowledge? Though he was the tenth man, but he got that uh, knowledge. I am the tenth. And he was so delighted and he got the results of that knowledge also. All sorrow went away and delight came to him, tripti came to him, delight, bliss. So the knowledge is also possible. Ignorance is possible, knowledge is possible, indirect knowledge is possible, direct knowledge is possible. The tenth man's story is so wonderful, it, it, it easily answers these questions. Now one might think, how do I actually apply it? So I'll give a short meditation to apply the tenth man story. Uh, it's a practice in Vedantic inquiry. We'll do that and then conclude. The, the technique is this. Listen to the instructions carefully. The important thing is, one, to listen, two, to understand, and three, most important, the important thing is to actually note it in my own experience. Uh, to actually note it in my own experience. We'll see how that works. So if you sit in a relaxed way, um, and just so that the body is stable, when the body moves around or is in a bad posture, it affects the mind. And the mind is our instrument in these inquiries. Sit in a relaxed way, straight, not rigid. Gently close your eyes and listen to my voice. Remember, listen, understand, and track it in your own experience. Watch it. Actually experience it moment to moment as the instructions are given. What are we going to do? We are going to see, we are told that we are the witness consciousness. Now we are going to see that we are the witness consciousness. Actually realize that. Just like the tenth man counted, we are going to notice not ten things, but five things and count them and eliminate them from the possibility that I am this and then realize what I am truly. When I say well, who am I, the first thing that comes to mind is the body. The first thing that we feel that I am this, it's, it's the body. And then we notice the body. 
as you sit relaxed and quiet, become aware of the body. As we become aware of the body, we notice that it is an object and I am aware of it. Just as I am aware of the clothes that I am wearing, I am aware of the chair I am sitting on, I am aware of the body. As I am not the chair, I am not the clothes, in the same sense exactly, I am not the body also. It is an object. I am awareness and the body is an object. Not a suggestion, not a theoretical. Just see, it is a fact. This body is an object. I experience it. I am not it. The body changes continuously. And I, the one who is aware of the body, I am the same. I experienced the body when it was a child. I experienced the body when it was a teenager. I experienced the body when it was middle-aged and old. So, I, I am relatively unchanging and the body is changing. I am aware and the body is not aware. I am aware of the body. The body is not aware of me. So I am awareness, the body is not awareness. I am sentient, the body is not sentient. Because of these reasons I am not the body. Because I am the experience of the body and the body is experienced. Drashta and Drishya. I am unchanging, the body is changing. Savikara, Nirvikara and Savikara. And I am consciousness, Chit. And the body is Jada, uh, insentient. These are not just arguments. They are arguments, but they are more than arguments. You must see them as fact. It's true. Alright, then what am I? I look to something more subtler. Clearly I am there. I am not the body, but I am there, somewhere here. Then I look to something more subtler. The, the prana, the breath. Focus on the breath. Breathing in. Notice it actually, physically at the nose. Breathing in. Breathing out. This air that comes in, the action of the lungs and the, the physiological action of breathing. Am I this? Obviously the mind says, no, 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 I am not this kind of muscular action and a little burst of air that comes in and goes out. I am the experiencer of this process. I am drashta and this is drishya. It changes. When I am breathing in, I am the same awareness who is aware of the breathing in. When the breath is going out, I am the same awareness who is aware of the going out breath. I am aware of the prana when it is hungry. I am aware of the prana when it is thirsty. I am aware of the prana when it is satiated, full. I am aware of it when there is tiredness. I am aware of it when there is energy. So all the ups and downs and movements of the prana I am aware of. It changes, I am unchanging. I am nirvikara, it is savikara. And this prana, the breath, is it aware or am I aware of it? Very obviously. Note, I am aware of the breath. The breath is not aware of me. I am awareness and the breath, the prana, is jada, insentient. I am sentient, it is insentient. Because I am drashta and the breath is drishya. Because I am nirvikara, unchanging and the breath is continuously changing, savikara. Because I am consciousness, chaitanya, chit, and the breath is uh, jara, insentient. I am not the breath, I am not the prana. I look inwards. See, I am eliminating, just like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, like that I am eliminating. Not the body, not the prana, neti, neti, not this, not this. Now look at the mind itself. Thoughts and feelings and perceptions from all the sense organs. What you see and hear and smell and taste, all of them are dumped into the mind. They all become vrittis, movements in the mind. Memories, desires, likes and dislikes, they are all emerging and disappearing in the mind. Note. Then note, they are all drishya. I am, you are aware of it, we are aware of these things. So they are all drishya, I am the drashta. And it, is it changing? Yes, of course, the mind is changing continuously and fast. And I am the one which is watching all the changes in the mind. So I am relatively unchanging. 
changing and unchanging and then finally most amazing we always identify mind with consciousness but are you not aware of the contents of the mind are the contents of the mind aware of you not at all you are awareness you shining the mind is revealed the mind does not reveal you because you are drashta and the mind is drishya because you are nirvikara and the mind is savikara because you are chit and the mind is jada you are not the mind i am not the mind neti neti look at the instrument of knowledge the understanding which we are using intellect itself the one which we are using right now to think about these things and understand and get a clarity that instrument itself are we aware of it yes when it is confused i was aware of it when it gets knowledge i get i am aware of it confusion understanding these are activities of the intellect of the vigyanamaya i am drashta and the intellect is drishya i am nirvikara intellect is savikara changing i am chit intellect is jada most interesting consciousness is very closely associated with the intellect we always feel when we are when we are thinking and understanding we feel most conscious and yet that consciousness and the intellect the relationship is like the reflected face and mirror it is not the real consciousness i am chit and the intellect is jada neti neti i am not the intellect if you push now in your own experience not theoretically just look if you push beyond the intellect what does it mean i am not the body imagine the body is not there i am not the breath the prana imagine the prana is not there the breath don't stop breathing but imagine it's not there imagine mind is not there thoughts feelings emotions even the faculty of understanding of all of this the understanding also shuts down blank absolute blank world is not experienced body is not experienced breath and mind are not experienced intellect is not experienced blank and yet the blank is also experienced it's it's an object i am not the blank also neti neti that blank is the anandamaya the causal causal level what we experience in deep sleep i am not that then what am i like thou art the tenth there i have to make the inward turn that to which the body and the prana and the mind and the intellect and the causal state they are all appearing changing and disappearing i am that and that is the real consciousness it's just like moving from it's just like moving from the mirror and the reflected face in the mirror to the real face the movement must be in understanding it must be an intuitive movement just like that man realized i am the tenth exactly like that we must realize i am the witness of this entire range of phenomena from the causal to the intellect to the mental to the vital to the physical from anandamaya to vigyanamaya to manomaya to pranamaya to annamaya all of them are appearing to me and of course through that the external universe all of it is appearing to me in me the awareness i must be awareness because it's all appearing it is all experienced now consider this awareness does it get old does it get wrinkles does the awareness is the awareness born with the birth of the body does would it die with the death of the body is this awareness the is does the awareness become hungry or does the awareness become aware of hunger is the awareness breathing or is it aware of the breathing misery and depression does awareness become miserable or is it aware of the misery in the mind even ignorance 
and I do not know my nature as Brahman. Is awareness ignorant or is it illumining the ignorance, the mind, the intellect which claims I do not know, Brahman does not exist, I, I am not aware of Brahman, the Brahman does not exist. That ignorance, it's in the intellect and awareness reveals it. The awareness is not limited by the birth and death of the body. It, it is eternal, it is immortal. It is not limited by the sickness and health of the prana. It is not affected by the ups and downs and miseries of the mind. It's not the mind. It's completely unchanged by the ignorance and understanding. Even the ignorance and knowledge of the intellect. They do not affect me, the awareness. And the seed state, the causal state, which blooms out into the, the experienced universe, body, mind and universe, that also is appearing in awareness. The awareness is not affected by it, not smeared by it, not affected by it at all. I am free of the five, sta five sheets, the five levels of the human personality. I am deathless. I am free of the ups and downs of the mind. I am free of ignorance and knowledge also. This free, unlimited awareness I am. Never subject to sorrow. And this is the, this infinitude itself is my perfection, my wholeness, is my bliss. It is the nature of bliss itself. This is Ananda. So gently open your eyes. This experience, this process which I talked about is Vedantic enquiry. I did it with the help of the Pancha Koshas. Just as the man was dismissing one, uh, that for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, none of them are the tenth and the tenth man cannot be found. Similarly, we dismissed body, prana, mind, intellect, the ananda maya, the causal state. In and that, that I am not any of them and I showed why I am not any of them and then intuitively just as the man realized thou art the tenth you are I am the tenth person intuitively we are supposed to realize grasp it and there is no other there is no word for it it should flash it should be suddenly realized that I am the awareness in which all of this is appearing and the awareness is not touched by any of it and you are set free this is the meaning of the Brihadarne Upanishad mantra. Atmanam ched vijaniyat ayam asmiti purushaha. If the individual being, the jiva, the purusha, the jiva, uh, we, the sentient being, we are suddenly to realize, I am this infinite being, free of the five sheets, free of the three bodies, physical, subtle and causal, free of the three uh, states of waking, dreaming and deep sleep. If I were to realize this, kimichan kasya kamaya, desiring what? I'm infinite, what do I need? Whatever it seems to be there out there attractive to me, they're all appearances of me. Kasya kamaya, for whom? It's the individual limited being who's running around, you know, they're all rushing around in search of happiness. I am not that individual limited being. I am the infinite. Where will I to go and why should I go anywhere in search of happiness? Shariram anusang joret. Then why should I follow the body in its inevitable decline and death? Why should I uh, suffer along with the suffering of the body? The body will go on on its own trajectory. But I should know vividly I am always free of it. It's fine. Let a thousand bodies come and go. It's like Swami Vivekananda's story of the, uh, the big uh, buffalo, the ox, on whose horns a mosquito came and sat. After some time the mosquito felt bad and said, uh, Mr. Buffalo, I'm sorry I sat on your horn without your permission. I must have really troubled you. And the buffalo said, oh you're there, I didn't even notice. You can come and settle down there with all your family. Similarly to the world and all its problems, we should be so strong. So established in our own infinitude. Which is, oh, you're there, world. Old age, disease, death, uh, ups and downs in the world. I, I did not notice. You can bring your whole host of other problems also and settle down. They're nothing to me. 
you are an appearance a figment an imagination a figment of imagination a dream in me the awareness so this is the grand meaning of the bhridharnak upanishad mantra i pray to sri ramakrishna the holy mother and swami vivekananda may this great upanishadic teaching made flower in our lives and may we be set free of suffering may we realize that tripti that bliss which is our own divine heritage om shanti 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 hari om tat sat shri ram krishna rupa namastu